Uh, well, basically what happened is I started doing my family genealogy. I'm looking at over 30 years now of research. And there's been, uh, there's been ups and downs and brick walls and everything else in the family. One brick wall that I just uh, saw tumble just before Christmas was uh, on my maternal side. And what had happened there is that uh, I was looking back five generations to, to the brick wall that I'd been looking, looking for answers for for about 30 years. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I knew the apparent name of the father of my two times great grandfather. Knew nothing about his wife, knew nothing about where he was from, knew nothing about when he was born. Absolutely blank. I put together a, a little bit of a uh, theory about what I thought about the family, posted that in a number of different spots online, and a historian from Toronto came up, uh, sent me a, an email and said, well, your theory is, is very close to basically what you put on, online there. However, your, your family, uh, this Dr. James Henderson that I had talked about was not a doctor. He was actually a barber and uh, he was truly married. He had more than two children. He was not a slave owner, nor was his wife one of his slaves. Uh, they were actually free people of color from Virginia. And uh, I'm sitting there thinking, me? I'm, I'm about as Caucasian as they come. And my ancestry is our free people of color, African-American people of color. And I, and I wasn't, wasn't trying to kind of denounce that idea. I was, I was trying to come around to full acceptance of the idea because I was all excited. I mean, I, here my family is, is now stepping into a major part of American history. And because of their escape to Canada in 1840, a very important part of Canadian history as well. So I, uh, I, I basically took it from there and I'm, <laughs> I'm totally elated at all the stuff I've been finding out. Not totally excited about how they were treated back in those days. But uh, as we all know, there's nothing we can do about our history. Uh, our history is our history because it is etched in stone and there's nothing we can do to change it. All we can do is change the perceptions of what happened then you know, on, on today's basis. On the other side of the family, um, on the paternal side of the family, I go back to my brick wall, which is in Ireland. And that brings us to this little presentation here. Um, basically what happened is uh, my three times great grandfather on my father's side came from Ireland in the mid 1830s. And uh, there were three brothers uh, two brothers had families and they all came to Canada, separate times, separate ships, separate locations, but they all ended up congregating in one area. So basically what I'll do is I'll go through a little bit about this presentation. And the idea of the presentation is kind of what I would like to see as far as my family history is concerned. Uh, I know I've written a family history book on my family, um, of, like the family narrative, and it's full of pictures, it's full of stories, it's full of data, uh, but it's lacking something. And when I saw the light board on uh, the presentation on CHCH TV, I got kind of excited because I thought, wow. I can actually put my family narrative on a video, basically what you're seeing right here. I can put that on video and put it on these little mem sticks. And four generations from now, my three times great grandson 
or granddaughter, whoever may be watching, can take a look at it and, and say, wow, that's what my great, great, great grandpa used to look like. And not that I'm into scaring kids, but uh, yes, that's what he looked like. And uh, it, it just adds a, a little bit of a, a, an extra dimension to the actual presentation. Uh, also my voice, some of my body language and things like that, uh, it all kind of comes out in the video. And uh, I think that uh, if I had the opportunity to hear my three times great grandfather talking on video, uh, not that it was around in 1830, but if I had that opportunity, I would be totally elated. I'd, I'd be sitting there and, wow, that's him. You know, now I can actually place a, a face and a voice to the name and the date of birth and the, the era that they came came through. So this one here is uh, is basically a, a short and sweet version of of the original family coming to Canada and a little bit about the history of, of the church. So it starts off by saying basically that uh, it's a story of a a hardworking farmer in, in Ireland in the 1800s and how life was extremely difficult, very, very hard labor. And uh, they, uh, all they got in return was basically a life of poverty. So as I say, there's three brothers that, that uh, decided that uh, the spirituality and and the camaraderie and family life and everything in Ireland was just not worth the effort anymore that they looked beyond that and attempted to make it to uh, Canada where their expectations were a little higher than what they were leaving behind. We all know that leaving the family home, uh, whether it be the roof over your head or the country that you're from, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So I, I commend them for, for uh, looking beyond what life was like for them there and making that extra move. So they packed up all their children. Uh, they packed up everything that they owned. They left the life that they, they once knew in, in Ireland and made that three, three month journey to Canada. My direct line, Nathaniel and Elizabeth Barber, ended up going through Montreal, uh, traveling beyond that into Toronto, spending the winter in Toronto, and eventually going to uh, Sydenham, which is uh, the present day city of Owen Sound, Ontario. There they sat and waited for the, the survey to be completed in Derby Township in Gray County. And when that was completed, they decided that they were going to look at the land grant program that uh, offered 100 acres of land and, and deeds to this land to any, any participants that were, were eligible to participate. And what had happened is they were um, allotted this land if they, uh, if they cut out the wooded area uh, to a, a four acres a year for four years and built a homestead. And if they survived that, they were given a deed to the property. So that's basically what the, the Barber family did is they cleared, actually, Nathaniel had his 100 acres, James had 100 acres, Francis had 100 acres and Samuel had 100 acres. And they all did their, their due diligence and, and ended up with 100 acres of uh, property and deed by 1849. They also continued their spirituality through all this and they met at different parishioners' homes for a number of years while they were clearing their property and a number of years following that, until 1851, when Nathaniel and Elizabeth donated three quarters of an acre of property 
uh, just to the side of their, their farmstead to the Anglican Church of Canada. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, one page, the signature page of the, the thing. And we actually got a chance to uh, hold this uh, deed, take a closer look at it. There is writing on the page. Uh, there's a, a vast section of the, uh, the page that has uh, all the, the writing worn off. There's all kinds of wrinkles, there's folds, there's stains on it, there's holes through it. Actually, the stains are, are a reddish color, and I'm, I was wondering if they're not bullet holes, and, and that's the blood of my three times great grandfather. But uh, either way, it's his signature, that little X in the bottom corner, was uh, put on there by my three times great grandfather. So it's it, it's kind of kind of interesting. I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to hold that and to, to look at it a little closer. But through this uh, this deed, uh, they presented that to Bishop John Strock from the Anglican Church of Canada, and they eventually started construction of the, the church and the cemetery. One of the local parishioners and neighbors of the area uh, ended up uh, constructing the church. And there's a picture of the church. Uh, he built the church and eventually uh, when the church was completed, uh, the minister, uh, Reverend Mohon, Mulholland from Owen Sound rode his horse from Owen Sound to Derby Township to do the dedication service of the, the church. And when he got there, he tied his horse to the, the tree, walked up through the woodlot and uh, found a number of parishioners standing outside a locked church. When he asked basically what had happened and received his answer, he basically came back with some kind of damning words. He basically said, I curse the hands of the man that would do such a dastardly deed. Later to find out it was the contractor who kept the doors locked because they hadn't paid the final installment for the church. And he kind of retracted his words eventually because a short time later, they found Mr. Little, uh, near death in his workshop due to a, a large gash on his hand. So when the minister visited Mr. Little, uh, Mr. Little apologized and forgave the final payment of the, ch of the construction cost in turn for forgiveness for his deed. And uh, they went on to be become good friends and Mr. Little actually received a, a burial plot next to the church that he had built. So uh, all was forgiven and everything turned out happily ever after there. The cemetery, uh, the one, one notable thing on, on the cemetery is that on the sign for the cemetery, the, the date of the cemetery says 1842. Uh, the deed was not given to the church until 1851. However, 1842 is significant of the fact that Nathaniel's daughter, Eliza, was the first person that was buried on this property. Um, she died as a result of a tree that her father was felling. Uh, it fell through the house and, and he, uh, he ended up burying his daughter on the property. So the, they put the, the date of 1842 on there to, to add some significance to her burial on the property. There's a number of other family members. Uh, Nathaniel's son, Samuel, who died in 1861, attempting to rescue a, a cow that was stuck in the bog on his property. Three of Samuel and Susanna's son, uh, children, sorry, not just sons, it was a daughter and two sons, I think. They died in September 1858 from diphtheria. Susanna and her Second husband, James, who was also the brother to Samuel, they're buried on the property. Francis and Margaret and their, their children are also buried. 
just to the back corner uh, of the of the three quarters of an acre there. Most of the the actual barber family is uh, is buried along the back back line, except for Samuel and Susanna and their children. And if you notice on an earlier slide, that's their headstone to the words the back side of the church there. So they're, they're also buried up closer to the front. Most of the people there are Barber members, Barber family members. And as a result, the cemetery, uh, although it's called St. James Cemetery, has taken on the familiar name of the Barber Cemetery. Anyways, for all the present day descendants of the Barber family, the cemetery does remain inactive but it offers a pleasant stroll through the family history in a tranquil wooded setting. The residents of the area are uh, taking on the responsibility of maintaining the property and have really kept it in very decent condition. So it's, it's quite a, it's a need visit location for anybody that's doing any genealogy on the, on the Barber family. Anyways, that is basically the type of presentation that I'm looking at as far as, as uh, the genealogy. And, and as they say, it, it takes us away from the, the actual book or the actual narrative. Uh, it takes us away from, you know, thousands and thousands of dates and locations and everything. And it, uh, it takes us a little bit more of a, a personal setting as far as uh, as far as family history is concerned, the other thing that I use for my uh, the idea for the light board is basically my personal photography, and uh, I find the reason I was attracted by the light board is it's simple enough to use. Uh, and the only limitations you have with the light board is the limitations you have with your own imagination. Um, I find that if, if anybody's into photography or if anybody's into genealogy, uh, any collectors out there, anybody that's trying to, to do any sort of education, like whether it be uh, genealogical sem uh, seminars, or seminars on, on aviation, cemetery, uh, there you go, uh, how-to seminars for Canada Post, uh, anybody that wants to do virtual visits to the beach, there's the, your, your limitations, as they say, are as, as, uh, as, as much as your imagination will allow you to go. But uh, this is one of the, the air show pictures, the only air show that, that I had the opportunity to visit in 2020. But uh, so you're, the, the light board really is, is something that I, I've gotten really excited about. And the main reason for getting excited about it is is eventually being able to put together a number of different videos on my family history, uh, a couple of videos concerning my maternal side, a couple on my paternal side, the stories of my two grandfathers that fought in World War I, stories like this of, a, of the, the church and cemetery that was built, uh, all, all these sorts of things put them into a series of, of, uh, of video presentations for present day family members and future members to be able to take a look at and see basically what our family was all about. Anyhow, uh, that's kind of sums everything up as far as, as what I've been able to come up with as far as, as the light board is concerned, as I say, there's many other other things that I've been thinking about using the light board for um, as far as my personal photography and everything is concerned. So uh, 